Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to come and speak here. Uh, I'm going to talk about singularity formation for equivariant wave maps. This is joint work with two of my former students, Paweł Biernat, who is now a postdoc in Bonn, and Maciej Maliborski, who is a postdoc at Einstein Institute. <coughs> so, so here is the wave map equation uh, for a function, vector function phi. So this is so-called exterior formulation. Uh, uh, the domain of the wave map is Minkowski spacetime in d plus one dimensions. d is the number of sp special dimensions, and the target is the dimensional sphere, uh, which you think about as embedded in d plus one dimensional Euclidean space. And this uh, wave map satisfies uh, this semilinear uh, semilinear wave equation with gradient nonlinearities. Uh, so this uh, is a, a very nice geometric wave equation, which uh, is interesting for us, I mean us physicists working in general relativity, because it shares many features with Einstein equations, which are of course more complicated, and it helps to understand these features, in particular so-called critical behavior for Einstein equations. I, I'll, I'll say more about this later. Uh, I'm going to assume that the wave map is equivariant, which is this ansatz over there, uh, and then uh, the wave map equation reduces to this simple scalar semilinear uh, wave equation uh, in one plus one dimensions. And the variable r is like radial variable, which is positive. So we would like to understand global dynamics for smooth initial data for this equation. Smooth initial data of finite energy. Uh, so one uh, the, of the basic question is whether solutions can develop singularities in finite or infinite time. Uh, so to answer this question about singularity formation, uh, we need to know two things. Uh, first, that there is energy which is conserved, which is written over there. It's manifestly positive. And you see from this expression that for the energy to be finite, uh, the, 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 the solution U must uh, uh, go to a multiple of pi, uh, both at zero and at infinity. So, and we take a convention that this function at zero is zero, so therefore the, the value k, which is a multiple of pi at infinity, is, is a degree, a topological degree of this solution. And this is preserved in the evolution. This is sometimes referred to as topological stability. Uh, so this means that the Cauchy problem breaks into infinitely many topological sectors measured by this, labeled by this integer k. Uh, the second important feature of this equation, which is obvious from, from the equation, is a scale invariance. So if I rescale time and r by a positive constant lambda, then I get solution. Uh, and if you look how energy scales, with, uh, when I do this rescaling, you see that energy scales as a homogeneous function of degree d minus 2, uh, so uh, in, which means that dimension 2, in which energy does not see the scaling, is critical, and dimensions 3 and higher are supercritical. Now, most of the effort, over, well, a very heavy effort over the past 15 years or so, uh, uh, has been concentrated on the critical case, starting with some numerical simulations, then a, a breakthrough result by Michael Struve, who showed that singularity formation must have a form of, of harmonic map shrinking asymptotically to zero, and then <coughs> uh, some works which uh, which uh, refined uh, uh, information about, well, first of all, showed that singularities do form, 
and derived uh, rate the speed of, of singularity formation in the Struve mechanism. In contrast, supercritical dimensions are much uh, less understood. So there are some results in three dimensions, which is, from physical point of view, most interesting. Maybe I should say that in physics, wave maps are called sigma models. Uh, uh, so, so these results are mainly about existence of self-similar solutions, which are explicit examples of singularities and their stability. Uh, but as far as I know, there almost nothing has been known uh, about higher dimensions. So to set the stage for uh, blow up, analysis of blow up, I, I need to tell you first about self-similar solutions because you will see that they really govern singularity formation for this equation. So self-similar solutions by definition are invariant underscaling. So they are functions of one variable, which we call y, which is r over capital T minus t, and capital T is just added for convenience, and this is allowed by, by translation invariance in time. So if you uh, plug these ansatz into the uh, wave map equation, you get an ODE of this form written here. Now this ODE, has a, a singularity at the origin. It has a singularity at y equal 1, which corresponds geometrically to the past light cone of the, uh, of the singular point, t0. <coughs> so this is a point t0. This is the past light cone, which corresponds to y equal 1. This equation also has singularity at infinity. So now by, finite, by finite speed of propagation, what really matters is what happens inside the past light cone and on the past light cone. So, 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 so analysis can be restricted to the interval from 0 to 1, close interval from 0 to 1. And if we have a smooth solution of this equation on this interval, then this is an explicit example of singularity formation in finite time. Because for such a solution, the gradient of solution at the center blows up as 1 over capital T minus T as time goes to capital T. Uh, I'd like to make a remark that even though the analysis is restricted to the interval from 0 to 1, it is essential, uh, at least if you want these solutions to participate in the dynamics, that these solutions remain smooth outside the light cone, all the way to infinity. Otherwise, they do not play a role in dynamics. And there are examples of such uh, self-similar solutions which are, which are fine inside, but are singular outside the light cone uh, for some subcritical uh, wave equations, but not here. Uh, okay, so we would like to find if there are such smooth solutions for this equation. Uh, and one way to approach this is, is, is by kind of shooting argument. So it means we, we start with solution which is, which is good, smooth at the origin. Such solutions form a one parameter family, which is parameterized by the gradient of solution at the center which I denote by C, one can easily show that these solutions, these local solutions at the origin extend all the way to, to, to the open interval uh, uh, from 0 to 1, but they are in general not smooth at, at, at the light cone. Uh, there is one, uh, before I, I discuss uh, 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 construction of such solutions, uh, well, it's, it's worse to see this explicit solution, which corresponds to a particular value of the parameter c, c0. So this is, this is an explicit self-similar solution. Uh, this was first found in three dimensions 
uh, well, first proved to exist by Chatard and then found in explicit form by Turok and Sperger. And, and, and uh, last year it was found, uh, well, it generalized to higher dimensions. Uh, we believe that this solution is the only self-similar solution for dimension seven and higher. So I'll come back to this. Uh, 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 and this should be contrasted with the harmonic map flow for which in dimension seven and higher there are no self-similar solutions. So let me just one slide how this solution F0 was actually found. So this was inspired by, by Herbert Koch's talk in Banff two years ago when he considered generalized KDV uh, in, in, in powers with, with slightly supercritical powers, p, p equal 4 plus epsilon. And, and similarly here we can think about dimension as a continuous parameter and introduce epsilon, a uh, positive parameter epsilon, which is d minus 2, and change variables. And if we change variables and rewrite our ODE, uh, we obtain uh, this ODE in, in, in new variable f tilde and x and on the left hand side this is exactly the static equation for the harmonic map in two dimensions and so on the right hand side you have a perturbation so this is so the, the idea was to start a perturbation analysis and construct this solution perturbatively in epsilon but at the first step it turned out that the right hand side is zero so therefore, this is an exact solution. So, so you can think about this as an educated guess. OK, so how about other solutions? Uh, to understand other solutions, one has to understand analyticity properties of solutions at y equal 1. And, and this very much depends on the dimension. And actually, in each dimension, uh, it's, it's, it's different. So if you take. I'm sorry. If you take this equation uh, uh, and multiply it by y squared and 1 minus y squared and differentiate and keep differentiating, you will get uh, a hierarchy of equations, and I wrote just first two here over there, mm, which have to be satisfied for the solution to be smooth. And from the first equation you see that dimension 3 is distinguished because when d is 3, then f of at 1 must be a multiple of pi, so actually, which must be pi. So. Uh, now, <coughs> uh, so, so this is this what is written there, that in dimension 3, the solution which is smooth at, uh, at 1 is parameterized just by a gradient of, of at one. In dimension five, there are two possibilities. Either in the second equation, either both terms are zero. Well, the first term is obviously zero in dimension five, but the second term could be zero. But if, but, or, and this is, this is, uh, uh, this is this case. <laughs> okay. And Okay, maybe. Okay, that's wrong. Or we have to solve this system of equations and we get this behavior. And actually this explicit solution, which I showed you before, has this exactly this expansion at one. In even dimensions, there are no restrictions like that. In even, even dimensions, the solutions are parameterized by the value at one. So once we understand these analyticity properties, so we have one parameter family at the origin, one parameter family at the light cone, and we have to match them in a smooth manner. So, and here's the theorem that in each dimension from three to six, there is an infinite sequence of these shooting parameters such that the solutions are smooth uh, on the whole interval from zero to one. Uh, and this is a pretty standard shooting argument uh, in, dimension, in odd dimensions. In even dimensions, it's slightly 
more complicated, but still pretty simple. Uh, now, there is another method of constructing self-similar solutions, or more generally solving, uh, well, sh showing solutions for ODEs, which is a variational method. And this is, uh, th this is a, a, a functional the, for which self-similar solutions are critical points. And, but you see here, in order for this to be finite, you have to renormalize it. So you have to subtract the value of the solution at one. But if you don't know this value a priori, this is a problem. So for this reason, these solutions have not been found before, because, well, th there is a variational proof of existence of one of the solutions of this infinite family in dimension five by, by Chata, Kazanava, Chata, and Tahvil Darzadeh. Uh, but in this case, f1 is just pi half, which, by the way, is convexity radius of the sphere. So it's an uh, equator. So. So, so these solutions probably, well, it would be hard to find them by these variational techniques. OK. Now, once we have uh, self-similar solutions, the next step is to analyze the spectral stability, so the spectrum of small perturbations, uh, because this is essential uh, in, in understanding the role they play in, in dynamics. Uh, so it's standard to introduce uh, so-called slow time, so the blow-up happens when s, the slow time, is infinite and change variables, so this s and y are similarity variables, and in these similarity variables the wave map equation takes this form. Uh, so self-similar solutions are just solutions which do not depend on time. So there are stationary solutions of this for which the right-hand side is zero. So, so the standard procedure is we linearize around these this, this, uh, 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 self-similar solutions. The convention is such that uh, uh, eigenvalues lambda, which are positive, are unstable. So we li if we linearize around them, we get a quadratic eigenvalue problem. Quadratic because it involves lambda and lambda squared. And the quantization condition, so we want solutions of this linear ODE, which are smooth on the inter close interval from 0 to 1. This is a condition for quantization of eigenvalues. And this is the conjecture form of the spectrum. Uh, I will uh, give evidence for that in a moment. So, so first of all, there is a, a so-called gauge mode, which is always present in similarity variable, variables, which is due to the fact we, that we don't know this time, capital T. So by, by shifting this time, by, by time translation, we generate a mode which is explicit, and it has eigenvalue 1. So this is, even though this eigenvalue is positive, this is not a real instability. So it's, that's why it's called a gauge mode. Uh, then the conjecture is that there are exactly n unstable eigenvalues, so positive eigenvalues, bigger, strictly bigger than 1, and there are infinitely many negative eigenvalues which correspond to stable directions. So what is the evidence for this conjecture? So first let me discuss the solution, this explicit solution, F0, for which this conjecture applies as well. So in this case we have a luxury that we know this solution in closed form. So and we can change variables uh, like this and then this equation we, we, had, we had here uh, becomes uh, uh, a so-called Hoyne equation, which is a, a generalization of a hypergeometric equation, which it has four singular singularities at 0, 1, d minus 1, and infinity. But this is not very helpful because a so-called connection problem for Hoyne equation is unsolved, so in contrast to hypergeometric equation. Uh, I mean, it's not helpful in terms of proving this conjecture. It is very helpful, actually, in terms of computing the eigenvalues, because, for example, Maple 
knows Hoyne equation and can compute the Broglie scan of two solutions. So, Piet, so this means that you have no integral representation of solution to this ODE? That's, that's, that's what behind this? And this is the reason why the connection problem is... The, co the connection problem means that... The connection problem is this, that if I have a, a singular uh, uh, boundary value problem and I take a solution which is good at one end, this solution will be a superposition of good and bad solution at the other end. And connection problem is, well, for hydrogeometric equations, the coefficients in front of, of bad and good are explicit, not in this case. So, so they are explicit in terms of, of some hypergeometric functions, but still it's... Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, but there is a way around it. So, and actually we can take this solution, which is good at at the origin, this uh, and take a power series expansion. This is a standard Fuchsian analysis. Uh, we take this good solution in terms of a power series ar around uh, this would be actually a Hoyne, uh, a Hoyne function. But we don't, well, this, this power series is guaranteed to have a radius of convergence one because this is the nearest singularity, but in general it is not smooth at one. Uh, and the way to look at smoothness of this power series at one is to look at the asymptotics of the coefficients in the, in the expansion. And these coefficients satisfy a three-term recurrence relation which can be solved and these are asymptotic solutions of these recurrence relations. And this is a, a bad solution for which this, if, if this coefficient C1 is non-zero, then this won't be smooth at one, but and this is a good solution. So, so the quantization condition is actually that this coefficient is zero. And this can be used to compute eigenvalues with great precision and confirming this conjecture I showed you. Uh, and quite recently, Kostin, uh, uh, Donning and Glogic actually showed rigorously that this uh, does not have positive roots. Uh, but as I said, this technique very much depends on explicit form of solution F0. So we don't know other solutions in closed form. Mm. Actually, uh, so, so what we do for, 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 for other solutions. First of all, we can rewrite this problem in a self-adjoint form. Uh, so this is uh, just by, by change of variables, we can bring this quadratic eigenvalue problem into a standard self sturm louville problem with operator AN, which is uh, self-adjoint in this Hilbert space. Actually, this is very much related to the Laplacian on a hyperbolic space. Uh, now, the point, however, is that the eigenvalues of this problem, which I call mu, and eigenvalues lambda of my original problem, uh, these are two different things. So, because in one case I, I, I want solutions which belong to these functions space x, in the other case I want smooth solutions. And, it, and if you analyze this, you can see that these eigenvalues actually coincide, but only if the eigenvalue lambda is bigger than d minus 1 over 2. And in this case, so, so by analyzing this problem, we can re learn something about eigenvalues of our problem, but only in this range. And it's not difficult to see that if we take the gauge mode, which I mentioned before, and transform it to this function psi, we get a function like that, which is an exact solution of that with eigenvalue d minus 2. Now, from the shooting construction of these self-similar solutions, we actually have a complete control of the number of oscillations of these self-similar solutions. Therefore, we know the number of zeros of this function, so we can apply Sturm oscillation, theorem. And from this it follows, so this is different in dimensions 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, so in dimensions 3 and 4, they are exactly, this function has exactly n zeros, so they are exactly n eigenvalues, <coughs> Uh, below and, and, and in this case there are n-1 eigenvalues. 
So this gives us the exact number of eigenvalues for lambda bigger than d minus 2, but this leaves open the interval from 0 to d minus 2. <coughs> there is a gap. Uh, and actually, maybe I should mention, so that today there was a preprint by, well, by, by Collot, uh, Raphael and Scheftel, in which they, uh, for a very similar problem, a harmonic heat flow problem, well, the, sorry, the heat flow for semilinear uh, uh, wave equation uh, uh, for semi uh, well heat flow for for, for power law nonlinearities shows that there are no gap eigenvalues and it's very likely that this proof can be extended to this setting as well. So, uh, now, so there is this gap. So in this sense, I don't have a proof. That's why I call it a conjecture. However, numerical calculations show that, in fact, there are no eigenvalues in this gap. Uh, uh, actually, there is one uh, uh, surprising thing that, uh, that in dimension 6, there is, the, there is exactly one eigenvalue of our problem, which is not an eigenvalue of this self-adjoint problem. So, uh, so he, here is a table computed nu numerically. These numbers, we are physicists, so we want to have quantitative results. So these numbers will play a role in a moment. So you see that these are different dimensions. There is this gauge eigenvalue 1 always, and all eigenvalues are negative. So this is the least dumped eigenvalue, which will play a role. And this is for solution with one, unst one instability, which will play a role in dynamics because this is a codim for codimension 1 dynamics. It has one positive eigenvalue, the gauge mode, and all other eigenvalues are negative. And this is the eigenvalue I mentioned, which is uh, somehow uh, surprising that it's not, it, doesn't, it is not an eigenvalue of the corresponding self-adjoint problem. Okay, so, so we have self-similar solutions, uh, and which are spectrally stable, they have no growing mode. So this gives rise to a conjecture that well, they are natural candidates for attractors. Uh, and the conjecture is that actually this explicit solution, F0, is a universal attractor uh, in a sense that if I take generic, generic in a sense, well, in, in a vague sense, so I mean, that time. We take some initial data, and if they are large enough, they will blow up, and they will always blow up along, along this solution F0 in this sense. So they approach locally near the center of this solution. Uh, uh, this is a non-perturbative result. So we're, we're saying that this is universal for all initial data. In, in the case of data which are close to this F0, actually there is a proof of linear and nonlinear stability of this blow up by, due to Doninger uh, in three dimensions. So, and and it's, it's very likely that his technique can be extended to higher dimensions. Uh, so there is numerical evidence for this behavior, which I'm going to show you now. Uh, so and, and this tells a little bit more because it says that the dynamical solution approaches this self-similar profile exactly with the rate dictated by the least dumped mode, which is here. So, uh, well, the coefficient, of course, depends on the initial data and the time of blow-up depends on the initial data. So this is, a, this, this is a numerical evidence for that. So we see what we see here so these are snapshots, at, these are initial data shown by this black curve. Uh, this is in similarity variables. Uh, and the dotted red line is the self-similar profile. And you see as, as time uh, goes on, the solution approaches this self-similar profile. And actually you see this approaches it, so you see th this, is th this is the light cone one, so it approaches it also outside the light cone. Uh, uh, this is a more quantitative uh, uh, evidence for the same result. So, so what, what we show here is, is the gradient of the dynamical solution minus the gradient of the attractor 
and in, in a logarithmic linear scale and this shows that this is decreasing in time with this rate when lambda minus 1 is exactly the eigenvalue which was computed independently by this perturbative method. And this shows, this is a snapshot of solution at some late time and we compare the solution with a self-similar solution and the difference is the profile of this lowest mode. So this is the evidence. And this is just shown here in four dimensions, but the same is true in dimensions five and six. So this means that the solution is behaving like that, and of course we could add more. There are infinitely many stable modes. So, so this was about what we call generic blow-up or stable blow-up. Now, but we know that for this uh, equation, sufficiently small solutions remain globally regular in time. So there is a question, what is the borderline between uh, solutions which blow up and solutions which don't? Uh, and there is a very, uh, n very straightforward uh, strategy to analyze threshold, namely you take in a one parameter family of initial data which interpolate between small and large data. And then you try using bisection of the parameter along this family, could be a Gaussian with an amplitude, you can, you can fine tune to the critical value and then look how, what is the evolution for solution which has this uh, nearly critical uh, amplitude. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have, so this is a dynamical solution, and the candidate for the critical solution, which somehow sits at the borderline, is obviously the self-similar solution, which has exactly one unstable mode, which is the, the, the first solution in our family, which is not known in closed form. So, so we have this critical solution, self-similar solution. It has exactly one unstable direction, with eigenvalue lambda 1, and all other modes are decaying. So by, 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 by fine-tuning, we can make this coefficient as small as we wish. And if, if, we, if this coefficient is, is very small, then for a long time we don't see this instability. This is a standard settled point time behavior. And, and from this there follows various scaling laws, for example, if you look at solutions which do not blow up, but they are, but they, they, they are marginally subcritical, so they have A slightly less than the critical value, the gradient of these solutions in the center can grow to very large, uh, can, can become very large, and, and how large it is, it will scale with this. So, uh, so, this, this is, so this gives rise to conjecture that this self-similar solution with one unstable mode is a critical solution whose co-dimension one stable manifold separates blow up from dispersion. So here is a schematic picture of, of this behavior. So, 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 so this, here, here we have this co-dimension one stable manifold which we imagine as a smooth hypersurface in our infinite dimensional phase space and here is this self-similar solution which has exactly one unstable direction which is transversal to this curve and all other directions are stable and here is a curve of initial data which intersects this manifold and the data cor corresponding to the point of intersection will flow to this and the data which uh, will sl slightly miss it will approach it well, and then will we'll go either towards blow up or global regularity. Uh, surprisingly, so uh, I mentioned that, uh, that this uh, helped to understand critical behavior of Einstein equations because actually this picture, uh, which actually is very known, well, well known in physics of phase transitions because this is nothing else, this picture exactly explains the universality of of a second order phase transitions like in ferromagnets. So this was observed for Einstein equations. And in this case, the, 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 the analog of blow up is black hole formation. 
So this is a, a numerical simulation uh, illustrating this behavior. I guess this is in six dimensions. So uh, this, uh, this dotted line is, is this uh, self-similar solution uh, of co-dimension one, and this is a dynamical solution, the blue line, and which is fine-tuned to the threshold with this precision. And actually, these are, this is a pair of initial data on both sides of, of A star. So they evolve together because they are close, but here you see that the unstable mode has grown to finite size, so they separate and one will blow up, another one will disperse. So the, the blue one will blow up, and this one will disperse. And this is, uh, again, uh, again, this illustration of this phenomenon. Now we look at the gradient of the dynamical solution at the center. The gradient should approach the gradient of this self-similar attractor plus this saddle point. Well, the unstable mode with very small amplitude, like 10 to minus 26, plus uh, stable mode. And again, this solution will blow up and this will disperse. So this was in dimensions from 3 to 6. In dimensions 7 and higher, uh, I said before, there are no self-similar solutions except this explicit solution F0. So there is no natural candidate for this uh, co-dimension 1 critical solution. And the reason actually this self-similar solution ceased to exist in dimension 7 is the spectrum of the equator map. So there is the, the wave map equation has a trivial constant solution, pi over 2, which is mapped to the equator. This solution is singular at this origin. Uh, but if you look at the spectrum of this solution, then eigenfunctions are oscillating below dimension 7, but above dimension 7, the number of eigenvalues around this solution is finite. And this phenomenon is exactly responsible for that, that you lose these self-similar solutions. But at the same time, you gain this solution in a sense that this solution has finite co-dimension. And actually, it has co-dimension 1 if you uh, neglect the, the gauge mode. So, and, and the, the numerology here is actually, you have the same phenomenon for all, all different kinds of equations, so harmonic map flow, and, and, and this is just, everything is about, well, in this case, whether this uh, d squared minus ad plus 8 is positive or negative. And this changes signs somewhere between dimension 6 and 7. Uh, now, so what we can do? So, so so here I want to describe a, a completely formal construction of the threshold, which, uh, uh, which is actually due, well, in a, for, for harmonic map flow to Herrero and Velasquez unpublished paper many, many years ago. So, so we take inner and outer solution. So the outer solution is just a, this singular solution plus perturbations such that we tune away the single unstable direction. And the inner solution, well, this solution is singular at the center, so it's not good. So near the center, we attach actually a static solution, which is rescaled by some uh, a priori unknown function alpha of t. This solution is not good at infinity because it has infinite energy. And the whole point is, that the asymptotics of this outer solution near the center and the asymptotics of this uh, static solution near infinity match. They have the same, they match, so they can be matched. This is called match asymptotics. This is what Herrero Velasquez did. And by this formal analysis, we predict the, the rate of blow up, which is given by that. And this is type 2 blow up in the sense that this function alpha of t goes to 0 faster than linearly. So this is a completely formal argument. Uh, and actually, this argument doesn't work in dimension 7, <coughs> because in dimension 7, uh, this eigenvalue lambda 2 happens to be 0. So 
maybe there are some logarithmic correction, co corrections to this, we don't know. But actually this probably is not so much worth pursuing because now there is a, a new approach to type 2 blow up uh, uh, which was developed by, by, by Rafael Rodniański for NLS and then applied to other equations, in particular to the supercritical wave equation by Collot. And it's very likely this approach, which, uh, which does not use any matching, uh, can be uh, adapted to this case. Uh, but still, I believe with the results, with the same result. Mm. Okay, so let me finish with by mentioning some open problems. Uh, so I said before that the critical dimension is, is, is well understood, but there is one exception. Namely, we don't know what is the threshold of blow up in two dimensions uh, in the following sense. So it is known, well, this was this result by Struve, <coughs> that uh, if there is blow up in critical dimension, it must have a form of a harmonic map shrinking asymptotically to zero. So this is the profile of harmonic map in our case. So this function alpha of t, the speed of, of, of blow up must go to zero. Uh, for stable blow up, well, this, uh, this uh, uh, function alpha has this form, so this is a type 2 blow up. This was first derived uh, formally by Ovchennikov and Siegel and then rigorously by Rafael and Rodniajski. Uh, however, as far as I know, it is not known what is this function alpha at the threshold. So it is not known what is the speed of blow up at the threshold, as far as I know, so for, for this problem. Uh, so, uh, it is not known even if this is a, this is this a power law. Does it have a logarithmic correction? So uh, it certainly is faster than uh, t minus t squared. So this is clearly seen in numerics. But without an analytic prediction, it's impossible to detect some corrections numerically. <coughs> the second problem, which I wanted to mention, is the continuation beyond blow up. So whenever you have a solution which uh, which uh, forms a singularity. Uh, in finite time, there is a question, can you continue beyond? And in this case, uh, uh, well, you can always, uh, because these equations are invariant under time reflection, so when you have a, a backward self-similar solution, you can attach it to a forward self-similar solution trivially, and then you would get a weak solution which is singular at just a single point. And this, uh, well, such phenomena of uh, that solutions immediately recover smoothness are well known mainly for parabolic equations and for a corresponding harmonic map heat flow. Uh, so, uh, and actually we have numerical evidence that this happens and, and there is probably an interesting pattern of blow up times, or the sequence of blow up times. So the solution blows up and then blows up again and again. Uh, another problem I wanted to mention is when we change the, the domain. If we change the domain of the wave map I considered to, to a domain which is either compact or bounded or effectively bounded, so we lose dispersion. Now, the blow-up does not really see the geometry of the domain because the blow-up is a completely local phenomenon. Uh, however, whether the blow-up occurs or not does depend on geometry. And uh, we have some preliminary result for wave maps where the domain is so-called anti the space spacetime. So I don't have time to go into what, what, what this, this space-time is, or maybe I have, I don't know. So, yeah. so this is, uh, so if you take a unit sphere in, in Euclidean space and restrict to the upper hemisphere,
so this would be z. And you take a, a round metric on this, and then say, I take a, a, a line of uh, which goes to the equator and parameterize it by latitude theta, which is changes from zero to pi half at the pole, then the ADS metric is the following metric. where h is the round metric on this sphere. This would be an ADS metric in, in 2 plus 1 dimensions, but if I ch change it to 4 dimensions sphere, this would be ADS metric in, in, in 4 dimensions, which, which we have here. So. Well, as you can see from the... And actually, the constant time slices are just hyperbolic spaces. So the distance from any point here to the boundary is infinite. The boundary is just an ideal boundary of the hyperbolic space. This is like a, a, a disk model for hyperbolic space. However, null geodesics travel in finite time. So this is uh, from any point here to the boundary. So this space-time, which is of great interest in string theory, uh, uh, <coughs> is effectively uh, compact or effectively bounded, so, uh, from the point of view of light rays. So if you take this as a domain and consider the same equation as I did, uh, we find that evidence that arbitrarily small initial data blow up. And the time of blow up uh, scales with the size of initial data as 1 over epsilon squared. So this, the conjecture is that there is no threshold of blow up in this case. So presumably the Einstein equation itself would blow up like epsilon mm -hmm. minus. Say again? The, the, the Einstein equation itself, the perturbations of this, uh, of the full Einstein Of this, yes, actually, like yeah, actually this project is, is actually, is, is motivated by trying to understand the stability of this space-time as, as a solution of Einstein equations, exactly. The conjecture is the same that arbitrarily small generic initial data lead, well, in the case of Einstein equations, to black hole formation. Uh, actually, there is a, a, a corresponding problem for the critical case from ADS3 to S2, for which it is known that there is a threshold for blow up. For the same reason, there is a threshold of blow up here. So, so to have blow up in critical dimension, you must concentrate energy, which is uh, at least the energy of the harmonic map. So it means if we take uh, wave maps in, in, in this case, in the critical case, we cannot have blow up for uh, arbitrarily small initial data. Uh, but it does not exclude <coughs> the fact that solutions remain smooth, but the radius of analyticity shrinks to zero in infinite time. And this is the conjecture. In, in the critical case? In the critical case, the radius of analyticity shrinks to zero in infinite time, both for this model and for the full Einstein equations. And, and finally, I'd like to mention my favorite model, which is a supercritical Einstein wave map system. Uh, this is a rather complicated system with very rich phenomenology. Uh, this system has a dimension as parameter, and actually that's why wave maps are so such a good model for Einstein. Namely, for Einstein there is a coupling constant, which is Newton's constant, capital G. <coughs> and for wave maps there is a coupling constant we are called beta squared, and because this they have the same scaling properties, these coupling constants have the same dimension. So one is the inverse of the other. So therefore, this is dimensionless. And for this system, there is, well, this, everything is numerics, uh, except for existence of self-similar solutions. Uh, there is numerical simulations indicate that if this parameter is small enough, in particular, well, when this is zero, we are, there is no gravity. When this parameter is small enough, we have self-similar blow-up, very similar to what I described. But this blow-up 
disappears when the parameter is large enough. And this is an example of a gravitational desingularization. So this is for the cosmic censorship to start working, the parameter must be large enough. This is not a counterexample to cosmic censorship because the wave maps have singularities already without gravity. So, so gravity is not expected to help, but actually it does if the coupling <coughs> constant is large enough. And what's even more interesting, in suffic for sufficiently large coupling constant, we lose self-similar solutions, but we gain so-called discreetly self-similar solutions, which, uh, which uh, uh, only, I think, recently well, have been studied, I think, by Terence Tao for, 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 for systems without gravity. Okay, thank you. So you talked about uh, the equivalent case, so what about the general case, and you didn't say much about the, uh, the expectations. Uh, I don't know. So this is, uh, well, I didn't, I didn't talk anything about, well, you know, all the results are, are heavily, heavily rely on numerical simulations. So. And single, well, simulating singularity formation is numerically non-trivial. So, and uh, so we, we don't know how to do it in, in without these assumptions. So, so that's why all our results are restricted to equivalent case. Sorry. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah, I have, a, I have a question. So do you think that, uh, say, in dimension great, greater than 8, so uh, you have look the professor. So, so we know that there is this new type 2 type of singularity information, but then maybe there are still self-similar self solutions sitting there. Do you, do you think that they don't exist in this case? Or uh, did you try to... to, to well, we... Well, I, I would bet they don't exist, uh -huh. but I have no proof. So, <laughs> so it's one of the size. So no, I, I uh, well from, you know, for for this is an ODE after all, right? So for this ODE, this is uh, an absolutely overwhelming numerical evidence. There are no self-similar solutions. So. Uh, so so you so you tried it? No, no. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It it's not just that the proof of existence breaks down. No, no, for the power non it's not yes. true. No, no. no it's more complicated. It depends on the exponent. No, no, it's more complicated than that. <laughs> Well, I should say, well, for the power nonlinearities, the model is slightly richer because you can play it with dimension and the power of the nonlinearity, right? So, so here I have just one parameter, which is dimension. But of course, I could, I could generalize this to higher equivariance. And then I would have the second parameter. And then I would have a similar picture. So. Any other questions? Let's send the speaker.